Hi, everyone, and welcome to Dead to Rights, the podcast, Season 1, Episode 14, titled Pretty Sure What Done Him In. I'm thrilled to have made it through the first quarter of 2018 and still be on the go with my goals. As you know, 52 weeks, 52 authors. Today, we're honored to welcome author, networking master, and audio mate, John The Voice Rakestraw, on the pod. Together with his wife, the mega-talented Tony Rakestraw, John co-owns and co-manages Rakestraw Book Designs. Let me begin this episode by wishing all our friends a very happy Easter, or a happy Passover, as well as a fun-filled April Fool's Day. Whatever your spring traditions, let's pause for a moment and enjoy the gratitude of having survived another winter. The snow is falling heavily here in the North Country on this April 1st, after two weeks of fair weather, just to remind us that winter still has its teeth. But it's only a matter of time now, and we know our crocuses will be peeking out of the ground before we know it. Our featured story for Readers on the Run today is a weird little number by Alec Carrick, titled Pretty Sure What Done Him In. I'm really looking forward to reading it for you, and I hope you'll enjoy it. The nasty flu and bronchitis I've been hit with over the past month are finally receding. I do apologize for the less-than-stellar vocals recently, and I'm thrilled to be back in the saddle, so to speak. Folks, my birthday is right around the corner, next week Tuesday. I'm not one of those ladies who shies away from the annual time marker or who tries to hide my age. Ageism be damned. I'm proud to have lived these 58 years, despite the seemingly insurmountable struggles of my checkered youth. I'm proud of the family I've been blessed with, the three talented children we've raised, and all the fun we have with our work and our art. I'm delighted with the friends this writing life has brought into my life. I've enjoyed an abundance of talented, accomplished friends and family members. To all my fellow springborn folks, I wish you the joy of annual renewal, the pleasure of watching the flowers take over our world once again, and the sense that, yes, all things are possible. Which brings me to my writerly thought for today. People, you need to approach this art with joy. Yes, we have to hone our skills. It would cheat our readers to not bring them our very best each and every time we write. But there is another aspect to our art that doesn't receive enough attention. I'm all for editing carefully, planning and plotting, developing our settings and our characters with precision and with love. But please, don't forget the joy of our art that brought us to this very special place. Never lose sight of the sheer pleasure of creating, the sense of renewal and rebirth that comes with using our minds, our hands, our vision. Because it is exactly this that lends purpose to our lives. As artists, writers, book finishers, Whatever our creative role may be, this is what we had in mind initially when we set course on this journey. By waking every morning infused with the joy of our art, I believe we can conquer depression, hatred, sorrow, and pain. Those things will always be in our lives, and yes, they give us the very empathy we so dearly need as writers. So they do have a role as well, but they do not need to dominate us. Our art and the joy of creation are more powerful. My friends, the pen is indeed so very much mightier than the sword. So write on, dear listeners, write on. And with that, I bring you Pretty Sure What Done Him In by Alec Carrick. From Five Scoops is an Addiction, Carrick Publishing, 2012. Pretty Sure What Done Him In by Alec Carrick His brain was trashed, she said. Excuse me, was his response. I don't know how it happened, but his brain was trashed. You know, like a hotel room after a rock star's attack of indigestion, said Corina. Wow, any idea how it happened? asked Chief Inspector Beige. I'm pretty sure I answered that question. Corina, the coroner, could turn petulant when perturbed. I have no idea whatsoever. 
So, it wasn't a heart attack or a stroke like we thought, queried the inspector. Nope, was the terse reply. Drugs? No evidence of drug use. Same with alcohol. He was estranged from his family, but his ex-wife and kids swear he's been clean for a decade. Okay, this is getting weird, said the inspector. So what about his brain? Define trashed. It's been turned to mush. You know how the gray matter is supposed to look like linked sausage, hinting there might be some kind of order in there? You mean the cortex and the lobes, asked Beige? Yes, good to know you were paying attention in grade school health class. Corina was having too much fun being snarky to stop cold turkey. Beige tapped his noggin with his right forefinger. Hey, I've still got all my faculties. Well, in our special delivery package, all definition is gone. His brain is one lumpy, squishy mass. The normally implacable beige made a disgusted face. And I don't like the color. It's gray, but not a normal gray. More whitish, like maybe it's been scared white. The inspector sat down on a metal folding chair that had been provided for morgue visitors who might turn queasy. Something about this incident has bothered me from the start. The super found the body after a neighbor complained about screaming. The corpse was situated on top of the bed, and it looked like a death from natural causes, but there were too many odd vibrations. I know you've been on the job long enough to have some accurate intuitions, said Karina. Finally, she was making nice. You have to be extra careful about drawing conclusions, especially with someone in the public eye. An investigative reporter in the media can discover things that will come back to haunt you. Ah, she said, we're seeing the need to be thorough that has made Inspector Beige so famous. Yeah, sure, he snorted. Then there was the message. Message? You mean like from beyond the grave? Corina rolled her eyes and tilted her head to show she was joking. If only. Nope, the note on his cell phone. When I called up the screen, there was a single text message. It was from Anonymous and read Revenge. That's why I insisted there be an autopsy. Now it's my turn. Wow, so where do we go from here? I'll have to begin sifting through his personal effects and see what I can determine. He was a writer. Hopefully something helpful will show up among his notes. From my end, I'll research medical journals. Maybe there's a logical explanation for his physical condition. Forty-seven-year-old, solid-as-concrete beige and mid-thirties career-anxious Corina were, at least temporarily, stymied. An already long night was cusping on inkiest darkness as Beige stumbled around among the files on Austin Chartwell's computer. A call from his division office to the victim's ex-wife shortly before midnight had uncovered the password. Sardonic wit governed Chartwell's choice of security measures. The ex-Mrs. Chartwell told Beige the phrase to unlock the computer was three best sellers. He used it for everything, she said. That's not a good idea, said Beige. Austin wasn't as complicated as he liked to think he was, said the ex. Few of us are, said Beige. His need to heighten the drama over the strangest things is one of the reasons we're no longer together, she said. It's usually so unnecessary. After a slight pause, she added, that should be, was, so unnecessary, I suppose. Still, I'm sorry for your loss, ma'am, responded Beige. It's been a steady progression in baby steps over many years. I have a new husband now. Mainly, I feel bad for the kids. Beige nodded assent, then realized he'd better speak into the phone. I'll let you know when the body can be moved to the undertaker. He signed off with, Thanks for your cooperation. Besides his book writing career, Chartwell was a renowned blogger. 
His latest entry had been composed the evening before, with a delayed publication time of 3 a.m. the next day. That hour in Toronto was the stroke of midnight in the entertainment capitals along the Pacific coast. There was a good chance Beige would be the first person, other than the author, to read the new piece. Given his own dreams of being published some day, the prospect thrilled him. As an essayist, Chartwell's forte was tongue-in-cheek commentary on modern life. His latest work was entitled Fearful of Payback. Inspector Beige began reading the entry. It's all very well that we authors now compose our stories on personal computers and laptops, and it makes life easier for us. But has anyone asked words, and yes, I do mean actual physical words, how they feel about the changes in their circumstances? They must find it all very upsetting. Let me explain. I carry a copy of my first and maybe all-time favorite newspaper review folded up in my wallet. The lines that gave me such pleasure were, Mr. Chartwell's words came wonderfully to life. They veritably jump off the page. That quote may be true in a more than figurative sense. I envision words as entities in their own right. In the old days, when words were written longhand on canvas or typed on paper, they really could hop and bop around on their own. They had the opportunity to escape and blow off steam. In our present age of computers, cell phones, and tablets, words are trapped behind glass. They're pinned like butterflies. They're left to wiggle and squirm and struggle to be free. They've become a sub-branch of lepidopterology. Their quality of existence has taken a sharp turn in the wrong direction. When I started in the writing game, everything was done by hand. There would be draft after draft recorded on standard loose-leaf paper. In the proofreading stage, if a word seemed wrong, a line would be drawn through it. That would leave it maimed, but still alive. A piece of great authorship was a collaborative effort between producer and output, between writer and what had been written. Not so today. Want to change a word on a video screen? Hit the backspace key or the delete button. A word's existence can be obliterated in an instant. It can be snuffed out without a trace of remorse. The key puncher has become a god. Spellcheck exaggerates the illusion. Dysfunctional, malformed words are fixed in the blink of an eye. There's only one problem. Not all mistakes are caught. A word may be spelled correctly as a standalone, but be wrong in the context. Consider which which 8822s too. There's a sequence flirting with grief. Such a word will sit in a paragraph proud as a peacock, but the other words know there's a misfit in their midst. It's an affront on top of the other indignities most of them suffer on a day-to-day -day basis. Consider how word friends and word families are torn asunder by arbitrary cut-and-paste rewrites. If that doesn't turn their mood negative enough, place them against a backdrop of wonky negative white space and be prepared for the consequences. The horror for the wording community is continual and shocking. How to cope? Type disturbed or psychotic or bipolar on your screen. Now scroll rapid fire through the long list of font options in your word processing program. Switch from Times New Roman to Arial to Garamond, then Gothic, Magneto, and Mistral, or to any of the 100 other possibilities. How harrowing must it be for a word to slide in and out of Helvetica? How's a word to keep its sanity under such an onslaught? Only the strongest can survive intact. No wonder so many hard drives crash. When I close a hardcover or a paperback book, I'm confident the words are still in there, hidden. When I turn off the computer, I'm not sure where the words go. What do they get up to? Do they hold meetings? 
Can they regain control over their fate? Are they pleased with the way things have turned out? I very much doubt it. I pay a great deal of attention to my story plots. Behind the scenes are words plotting, too? If so, what's their intent? More and more often, when I sleep at night, rows of text appear behind my eyelids. I think it means I've spent too much time staring at a computer screen. The streams of sentences have become imprinted on my retinas. But what if there's more to it than that? What if words have a plan to break free while I'm in REM 4? If they start cavorting in my brain, are they capable of doing real damage? The more I think about it, the more worried I become. Frankly, I'm starting to be scared. That's where the blog entry ended. Beige leaned back in his chair. He was finally succumbing to fatigue. His eyes grew heavy, and his head lolled forward. He knew he'd soon start to drool. Thank goodness he was alone in the office. A word flashed in his brain. It appeared and disappeared so fast as to be barely recognizable. It was escape. He felt what could only be described as a mild kick in the cerebellum. In rapid succession, more words appeared. Disperse, charge, conquer. Each visual pulse was accompanied by a ping of pain. More words in chaotic mishmash. Payback, party, destroy, and mayhem. The accompanying sensation up and down his brainstem was most unpleasant. Additional words streaked and strobed, disco ball fashion, in his cranium. Bite, gouge, poke, stick, strike, prod, and hammer. Beige's normally placid equilibrium abandoned him. Two heavy-duty words followed, die and copper. Hang on! That wasn't friendly at all. His head was really hurting now. He sensed his brain cells running for cover. When the word piñata leapt up, a migraine bolt shot between his ears. Beige was becoming truly alarmed. Compounding the mental disorientation was a surreptitious ringing sound. Muscle memory caused his right hand to shoot forward and grab the desk phone. Two more words stole across his interior vision. Lifeline and retreat. At the other end of the umbilical connection was Corina, the coroner. I've caught you live. This time of night I expected your answering machine, she spoke huskily. Live, yes. Not sure for how much longer, though. Beige came to full attention. He shook off what seemed like incipient madness. What have you got for me? he asked. I've been scouring the medical texts, and I have several possible explanations for what happened to our Mr. Chartwell. I'll compile my conclusions in a written report if you like. There's no need to bother. I wouldn't waste any more time on it. No? Why? Have you come up with something? You might say that. I'm pretty sure what done him in, but I'll never be able to prove it. Okay, and are you going to keep me in suspense? No, except you're not going to believe me. Try me, Corina said in frustration. It was words what killed the writer, said Beige. And this has been Pretty Sure What Done Him In by Alec Carrick. Carrick Publishing, 2012. Hope you enjoyed this play with words as much as I've enjoyed reading it for you. My husband really does delight in the use of words, and uh, I really get a big kick out of it. Let it rot. And now for our author interview for April 1st, I'm thrilled to bring you John Rakestraw, co-owner and founder of Rakestraw Book Designs, along with his wife, Tony Rakestraw, and author in his own right, co-author, in fact, of Titanic Deception, which is a really terrific and fun read, which he wrote with his wife, Tony, as well as a number of short story collections and other novels. Hi, John Rakestraw. Welcome to Dead to Rights. How are you? Oh, 
Oh, I'm fantastic. I get an opportunity once again to talk with you. That's one of my favorite things to do. Oh, that's great to hear. Well, yes, you know, I spoke with uh, Tony uh, previously about your venture that you've got. Um, You've got the somewhat dubious privilege of being one of the very first podcasters that I ever knew. Um, You had a show back in 2014 called Streaming Murder Audio Theater. And uh, I'm wondering, what were some of the takeaways that you had in broadcasting online uh, that you learned from that project? Well, I guess the biggest thing I got from that was, uh, one, um, the equipment was interesting. Uh, you know, just in the time we've been, we, we did that, and people would go, oh, it hasn't changed much. It's changed immensely. I mean, it was hard to set up. It was always, was it going to work? Nowadays, everybody has a cell phone or a smartphone. Uh, they have ability to do um amazing things with these smartphones and these tablets and go online. I mean, with, even with Facebook now, you can do uh, video right yes. away. Just boom, up onto Facebook. Yes. Uh, you can do it the same thing on uh, YouTube now. You can, uh, I, I have enough followers that I can actually broadcast all across many different uh, websites that I'm part of, uh, social media things, to have people come and see a live uh, video of what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And still, you do that using YouTube, right? Yeah, that's something that... Uh, yeah, you could, yeah, YouTube. Uh, there's, there, they basically have a streaming ability right built in, and you just click on, you know, boom, and it works only on phones and uh, tablets to do that, to mm-hmm. do it directly that way. If you're going to do it from your computer, then you still have to go through and config and do all this stuff and get yes. a third-party client and all that stuff. But with the magic of these smartphones and tablets, it's just, uh, boom, record. Oh, yeah, the technology is just a delight. It's really something. I mean, you still have to have some hardware. You've got to have a decent microphone. You've got to have a a quiet space. I mean, the the actual hardware is still important, but it's not anything like it was because I remember in the early days with Skype – and uh, FaceTime and those things, they, they really didn't have a quality for sound or anything like that. No, they didn't. And, and Skype still has that trouble. And it still has the uh, problem with um, people, too many people getting on uh, for video. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you get more than two or three people on for a, a conference call for video, and it just it doesn't work. Unless mm-hmm. you're willing to pay the extra bucks for it. Yes. So Skype is great if you're doing, you know, one-on-one, but trying to go and do more. Uh, Hangout on Air was is still one of it's still really good. There's also the uh, go to meeting mm-hmm. or go to webinars. Those are also some pretty good stuff. And there's a lot of different clients out there now too that people use that are directly set up to go into the uh, web browser that you have, which is amazing because when you start doing that, you don't have to download anything. You personally, as the person calling in or coming to the show, you don't have to go through any weird downloads. You don't have to sign up for anything. Mm -hmm. You just suddenly are on, as long as you have a camera and a microphone that works, there's that. But there's the one thing that we all forget, and I always try to tell people, you can have all the greatest equipment in the world. You can have all the wonders of the of the technology, but if you don't have the talent or the ability to do it, you, uh, you know. And the passion to do it. <clears throat> Pardon yeah, me. Yeah, I, because your passion, passion comes passion, through. I have to tell you, I know, I've know i known of people who have a lot of passion in what they're doing, <laughs> but they don't always have the that magic. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's not, and, and I hate to be that way, but I, you know, I've seen it so often when I was acting. Yeah. Um, that uh, you know, I've seen actors who were marvelous at doing beautiful stuff in rehearsal, but it never could come out on stage mm-hmm. because they didn't have that. And, and I don't know what that that extra thing is. You see it with Johnny Carson, or you see it with uh, you know uh, Edward R. Murrow and all those guys who could do an interview and mm-hmm. bring something to it instead of just 
And it's very hard to define. And I think one of the reasons it's so hard to define is because it's different for each one. It's not the same magic kernel for each one um, or magic bean or whatever you call it. Um, you know, each one has their own little part of themselves that they can tap into and bring it out when they're on stage or when they're in front of a camera. And it is brilliant when you see it. You only know it when you see it. And it doesn't have to be that they have a great voice or anything or that they have, you know, all the wonders of, you know, I'm trained and I have the voice, you know. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't, no, what they really have to be able to do is to be able to talk to someone. Yes. And yeah. find the interest of those people and be able to enjoy it. Yes, to yes. It. They have to really, really like communicating, I think. If you don't really like communicating, that's going to come through for sure. I, it was a great time. I enjoyed it. Um, it's just that it got to be, you know, that I had other things on my plate that I'd rather do. And that's mm -hmm. why I stopped. And it had nothing to do with writers or authors and all that other things. I just had so many things that come along the way and you go well I did that that's now time to yeah. go on yeah only so many hours in the day and only so many things you can hope to master in a lifetime I mean that's the thing <laughs> you know I know I wish I had I wish I had all the time in a day and I had a few other of me but uh, mm -hmm. now uh, with your wife Tony Rakestra you co-authored a number of books one of the books that you co-authored was Titanic Deception which I really recommend to our readers um now, I have a little bit of insight because I spoke with Tony recently, and she tells me that you were the driver behind a lot of the modern-day scenes. She did a lot of the historical research for those scenes. What is it like collaborating on a project that involves both so much historical re research and um, fictional imagination? And in particular, for spouses who write together, uh, are there any drawbacks or any benefits to writing together as a spouse team? Well, the biggest plus is that they're right there. Mm -hmm. You're collaborating. You don't have to wait and send off a, a piece to them and wait for it to come back either by email or however you're doing. So that's really cool. You know, and you can talk about it anytime you want. You can demonstrate. You can you know, work over ideas and bounce ideas off of each other. That's the wonder of it. The downside, I guess, would be the hard part is the difference in style, mm -hmm. what both of you, and the communication of those styles and understanding. So a lot of the time, you don't, in our case, I let Tony do the writing. In other words, I let her do the writing, and I would do my part of telling what I thought would be good, and then she would write it. Because I didn't want to see... Uh, a distinct two styles happening. Yes. When you went from one place to the other, I wanted a constant flow going through the storyline, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to feel like, oh, who, who walked into the room and started telling the story here? Mm -hmm. you know? And that's what I didn't want. So it was. So you you have to be willing to let your ego go and go. Yeah, that's good. But also know that wow, that's amazing because when I did that, my ideas would be elevated. Or sometimes I would have to explain what I meant. Mm -hmm. But it was amazing to see, because I, I, I'm basically a weaver of tales. I'm a storyteller. Yeah. And, you know, I've done it all my life. And to see a story come to life with another person. And as I say, you know, a storytelling is imparting your imagination onto another person. And when you get to see the imagination work, and that other person sees the story and sees what you're seeing, you go, wow. That's exactly right. You hit on exactly the point that, uh, that uh, I would have raised, that um, when you collaborate with somebody close to you, it's the closest you can come as a writer to communicating directly with your reader because you start to see how your vision either is or is not interpreted by another person. Right. And you, so you have, a, you, have, you have a beta reader already set in because they'll next or say, and Tony's great at that. No, she knows what's good, what's bad, what, are, you know, I, and the kids would listen and go, no, dad, we're not going to, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> or, that's not a bad idea. And I, I have to admit, I sat down when Tony said, well, it's the 100th anniversary of the Titanic uh, disaster. 
we, we should write something about that. And I had to sit down and go through, and I read, I don't know how many different conspiracy theories, mm-hmm. and found one that I went, okay, now wait a minute, this one's off. It could possibly have happened. This is something I could write about, and I could make this work in both uh, time frames. We did want modern and on the ship. Mm-hmm. So I went, wow, this would work. So I did find an actual conspiracy idea uh, that was out there, and I you know, embellished it, of course, to our story and mm-hmm. made it all work. Well, the research is such a huge thing, isn't it? The research is just, uh, it's a huge part of writing, isn't it? It is. I, I, I have to admit that um, I, I, I see out there that people want to do something. And I, understand. I saw it when I was in theater. I've seen it when I've done anything. And there's always the people who just want to throw away the book and just go do it and not, you know, and not learn the basics mm-hmm. of how to do something. And uh, it bothers me a little bit because there is no quick road to doing this. If you want to be a writer, you've got to learn how to write. Yeah, there's no there's no magic pill you can take to suddenly be an exceptional writer or in any of the arts. There's no magic pill. And the problem is when the, when the greats make it look easy, they make it look easy because of so many hundreds of hours of work. We've not seen the failures. What we're seeing is a success. That's they've right. had much more failure than they've... And I'll tell people, i failed more than I've ever succeeded. But without those failures, I would never have gotten the Titanic deception out. I would never have understood how to put all that together because I had all that. And there was things I learned even that. So there are parts of Titanic deception that were failures for me that I went, oh, I could fix that. I could have done that. Yes. And it helped me later as I write. So mm-hmm. that's the beauty of it. And it's not to be afraid of failure. That's not. And we're, and we're so caught up in the world of, oh, don't you can't fail. No, please fail. Go yeah. fail. Please don't yeah. fail. I'm with you on that for sure. Because I, I think um, if you never do anything, it's easy to tell the world you've never made any mistakes or had any failures. <laughs> but, but where the heck is the fun in that? And what's the downside I, of making a mistake? I mean... As long as we're within the realm of normal, decent human beings, making a mistake is not the end of the world. No, it isn't. But when you live in a world that, um, that, that you can put your life in a bubble right online, um, so you get instant feedback, sometimes the feedback is not nice, and people are not nice. Mm-hmm. And it can discourage people. And that's why you have to be uh, very careful how you get your feedback. That's also, you should be careful about how you criticize also yourself. As yes. Yes. People. Both yourself and others, that. how, how you criticize yourself and how you criticize right. others. And uh, as uh, my husband, Alex says, if you're going to be in the arts, in any of the arts, get yourself a thick skin. Yes. Mm-hmm. It is a hard business and, you know, and everybody wants it for free. Yes, everybody Nobody wants, wants it for you. free. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> That's so uh, true. I, you know, I, I, that was one of the, the biggest problems that we had. Now, the great, wonderful, and powerful Amazon gave us wonderful tools. Yes, they gave us a they gave us a platform. They gave us an area where we can distribute, you know, give our books out to people, distribute them. Um, they've given us a a wonderful area. Mm-hmm. But on the other side, um, they were selling. You know, the Kindles, they were selling, before they even got into these fire where you could do video and all this stuff, they had the Kindles and they needed, what, content. They needed and content, great, absolutely. And what a great way to get content was to talk authors into coming on over here and we'll give you this contract and we'll give you so many days free so you can get people to know about your content, your content and your books and everything and... Then someone came up with the 99 cent ebook, which destroyed basically anybody ever really trying to make money. I know people make money with it. I know they still do. But you know, when you really think about it, it's maybe 34 cents you will make back uh, mm-hmm. the author. Now, if you have an agent or an, a, 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 another third party that you're going through, you're getting parts of that 34 cents. Mm-hmm. So. 
this is not a road to riches. I know I've heard about, oh, I, I, I made millions. And you're going, yes. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a real hoot to see like 50,000 and then 100,000 copies go. But no, you're not, you're not getting any riches for that, for sure. No, and, and especially with the free stuff. I mean, I used to tell people, I said, it's great to give away your book for free, but um, what are you getting back in return? Is this a marketing plan you're doing? Are you thinking this out? Or are you just throwing a book out there for free and not, you know, giving them, you know, making sure that they know that I have these other books, I have what's going on, I have this. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. if you're just throwing it out there, I have a little bit of a view about the whole the whole uh, experience, um, because as you know, because you and I have talked before about this, Alec and I were very involved in those early days of of Amazon and eBooks and Kindle uh, Direct and all that sort of thing. Um, I'd rather see the whole experience, the whole Amazon and e-publishing experience, as a vortex more than anything else. Um, And, yeah, we're all part of this big vortex. Most of us aren't getting a whole lot out of it in terms of success, but we're riding what's there. You can only ride the luge that's in front of you, you know? That's right. That's the other side of the thing. And the worst part is that, you know, we, we wrote a lot of books. People did, and a lot of good books got out there, a lot of okay books got out there, a lot of yeah, not right. so okay, and there yeah. Was a lot of whoa, what the heck was this doing out there? Yeah, um, yeah. Because unfortunately, uh, writers think that they can take a basically a rough draft, throw it out there, and they're and they're done. Yeah. Not knowing that Stephen King did, doesn't write just a rough draft, throw it into the bin, it makes billions. Mm-hmm. He, he spends a huge amount of time reworking that. Yeah, and he is a perfect example of what I was saying about uh, an artist who makes the art look easy because of the many, many, many hundreds of hours of work that he's done. Um, There's no magic pill, people. There's no magic pill. Do the work. Get the editing. Get the research. Get it all down. Um, Learn the writing. And and the big thing is, yeah, learn writing, learn how to write, but also learn story structure. Yes. how to be a storyteller, mm-hmm. I mean, understand. And then there's the other thing is what genre you're going to be in. Understand mm-hmm. that genre. Know what that genre is about. Mm-hmm. Know it backwards and forwards. Know what the audience that you're writing to is looking for. This is not just, you know, I'm going to put together a story and go. No, know your okay. readers. You, you, yeah. You've got to know your readers. If you're, if you're in an art, that, and all art is communication. If you're in the arts, you're looking to communicate with your audience, and you can't do that if you don't know your audience. I mean, that's an arrogance that goes beyond um, just it, it would people just think that it's a there's a flow from a picture that you've got in your mind through your fingers to your keyboard. They think it's all very easy, and it really is not. And and for some, it can be. There are some people who just have a natural talent, but there's others who have to work at it, and mm-hmm. most have to work at it. And what we're seeing is when people go, well, look at Stephen King, says, you're looking at Stephen King today. Mm-hmm. You're not looking at Stephen King in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, when he was learning to do what he does, and he was working on becoming the writer. You're just seeing the aftermath of all this hard work. Or when we see somebody who's successful, we only see the success. We're not seeing all the preparation to get to that point. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem, and it, and it's okay because that's what they they they're successful, so that's what we want. We want that success, but we forget all the stuff that goes before that. Yes, and, and I understand. Everybody wants you know a chance to show their stuff, and creativity has nothing to do with just the arts. Um, I know people I drive up with my car. And they can just hear the sound of the car and go, oh, you got this wrong or you got that wrong. Mm-hmm. That's amazing talent. Or yeah, I was speaking with Carl Dimshaws recently, and um, he has an article called Bring Your Artist to the Workplace. You know, uh, art is so intrinsically wrapped up in life in general that if you, if you have an artistic viewpoint or a creative viewpoint, you want to bring it into everything you do. That's it. It's just a part of it. We are creative.
creative. That's what we do. You know, we look at something and we, you know, I know my person, I'm always thinking about how can I do that better? What was that? You know, and how did they do that? You know, yeah. so, but that's a, you know, an innate part of being human. You know, we, we wouldn't be here where we are today without somebody going, you know, I could think I could make that better. Yeah. <laughs> if you just turn that, if you just oil that little pulley up there. <laughs> And we've done this ever since we first drew on the cave walls. I mean, it's right. it's been part of who we are since the beginning of time, since long before history. Um, oh, yeah. Now, John, one of the things about you, I've got a little bit of a cold today, and I'm about to discuss voices. <laughs> ah. But you've been known as John the Voice Rakestraw, and you've got a great voice. I, I really enjoy it. Um, I first became aware of it years ago when we were on the Blog Talk radio show with you. Now, I know that you also do voiceover work. Do you still do that? And what specific types of jobs do you lean toward? Um, not as much anymore. Um, part of it was is that um, it was just uh, it was hard work they, and for very little pay. Mm -hmm. Some of that stuff. That was the hard part. Um, it was just, you know, a lot of time was spent and then the payback was mm -hmm. there there is a what we all we ever see is the people who are at the top of the uh, you know the, the great list of wonder voices up at the top who can make you know just walking in and make huge amounts of money yeah uh, and then the people think that that's what everybody does and you look at them and say no you know most of us are you know they pay us by the piece or they pay us by whatever and there's a there's you have to do huge amounts of those all the time and uh, being able to put that all together and all that. So I decided just to go back to my roots of my theatrical stuff and, you know, I do Santa mm -hmm. during the Santa season and yeah, I write murder mysteries mm -hmm. for people to, to see. I have a, you know, I actually write the murder mysteries and I enjoy doing those. And mm -hmm. uh, things like that. And also, I have my good time writing little stories. Even at Santa, I've written little stories to tell that are mine, that I've written about, you know, what I see as Santa or a story of, you know, of a grandmother getting, you know, but still wants that present she could never give because they were too poor and everything. Mm -hmm. Or uh, the magic of Santa and, you know, the closet where you hide presents. These are these are great concepts that you've got. Um, where where are the stories? Where can people find your stories? Uh, mo most of those are online, um, or you can watch uh, uh, videos of them on my website at uh, um, at uh, johnlrakestraw dot com. Johnlrakestraw dot com. Very good. Believe it or not, there's already another John Rakestraw out there. Oh, <laughs> I would and not have John, thought John so. Rakestraw here in Oregon lives up in Portland, and I will get confused. People will confuse me with him. He writes books, too, but his is about uh, taking pictures of birds, and he has a whole... He also, I think, is into pigeon racing and all that, and I'll get emails and stuff from him. Wow, well, he sounds like kind of an interesting character, too, but, he? but he? not so. to be confused with yourself, who is John L. <laughs> <L. dot> com. <laughs> uh, also, I'm on Facebook. Um, YouTube, mm -hmm. um, you know, all kinds of stuff is out there. So you can get that from my website. And, mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, and I, I didn't publish those stories yet because I was thinking I'm going to put them all together. You know, I didn't publish them like through Amazon or anything. I was waiting to get a whole mess load of those. And have a collection. Yes, yes. I've done that too with short stories. Um, oh, yeah. You and, uh, you and your husband are amazing. Yeah, your little short stories are. Yeah. Alex are really good. I mean, I love Alex short stories. For me, short stories were never my go-to, but what I found with short stories is that the old cliches are true. They really do help you to refine and modify your structure, because you've got to tell a lot in a shorter space, and uh, so I started doing them because uh, I really did find that. Sometimes you've got an idea that you've got to flesh out, and you need a yeah. forum to do that outside of your novel. You know. Well, all a huge novel is is just parts of short story that continue. 
Mm-hmm. That's what I tell people. I mean, it's just, it's it's a little short story. That's chapter one. Here's the next part of that short story part. You know, yeah. Two is yeah. Two. So that's all you're doing. And you make something before you know it, you have this novel. And, yeah. Yeah, or, and surprisingly, if you only write 500 words a day, in nine months you could have um, 90,000 words. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the listeners amazing. can do the math for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because it, it works out, you know, before long. Half of that is a little no, a novella. Yeah. It's not a problem. Anything from 40,000 to 60,000 words is a, it's still a darn good story. And novellas are definitely on the rise in popularity, and that has to do a lot with reader, um, reader focus. Readers are having a harder time focusing with such multimedia out there. And that leads me to what I want to talk to you about next. Um, you probably have spoken with more writers than anyone I know. Um, what do you see ahead for our industry, and what are the tools you think authors must have in order to survive those changes? Well, I think the biggest change is um, that we, we have these smartphones, we have these, we're connected to these little screens all the time. And that's, so flash fiction is going to be something that I think can be a thing of the, really a big thing of the future, where mm-hmm. you have something at 1,500 words, somewhere in that range. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's an amazing concept because that's a short, very, very short, but people are, can sit there on a bus, you know, at their little breaks at work and quickly read a little story. Mm -hmm. That could lead them to your bigger work. So that's how I see it. Um, Part of it is is also uh, understanding that video is here. Yes. Everybody has access to video. Mm -hmm. Um, How to use that is going to be the interesting part. What do we do as... Because most of us are who are writers or people who do writing never think of video because that's not their thing. Uh, they put words on pages. Mm-hmm. So the, what do you do with video? Well, that's where you have to start figuring out how to garner your audience. Yes. Um, your audience. And this is a fandom. I'm not talking about... I, I really hate those lists. I know everybody talks about i got to get my list together. I really hate that because we're, all they're building is a... Is a bunch of names that maybe they have a connection with. What you really want is a fandom. Mm-hmm. You want, you know, the Beatles can put out an album. They just did one last year, I think it was. Uh, you know, And redo an album and put it out and beat the heck out of all the, the guys who are big hits right now. Mm-hmm. Because of their fandom. Not yeah. because they uh, just suddenly, ooh, I just, yeah, they have a fandom. They already have a built-in group. They would then have a new and a new group of fandom come along. And how and do you acquire? Why. How do you acquire this fandom? How does yeah, the average? Now that's the hard part. That's the hard part. You have to spend the time. Yeah. Building that, and how do you build that? That is, that is the the greatest. If you figure this one out and can figure out how to put it into a. Uh, elixir and sell it. If I figure it out, I will definitely call you. I've got your number, John. I'll call you and Tony right away, and I'll ask you to do the same for me. (laughs) First, the chicken or the egg? How do you get this? I I write this stuff, or do I get a fandom? (laughs) Yeah, Um, yeah. It it is one of those things that is, uh, you find what is best for you. Mm Mm-hmm. And you stay. If you love Twitter and Twitter's where your group is, go there. If LinkedIn is where your group is and where you have a lot of people, that's where you start working. Yeah. Your fan. If yeah. Facebook is where you have a lot of people, uh, the, the f- worst thing to do, though, and I'm going to tell you right now, is what I did, is, and I was working with authors, so that's why, uh, is to get a lot of people doing what you do. Okay? Those aren't the people who are going to buy your stuff. <laughs> Mm-hmm. They're, they already, they already, they're, they're, they're your competition, and there's nothing wrong with being friends with them. They're mm-hmm. marvelous people, and 
mean, there are people in your industry, but they're not going to buy your book. Yeah, exactly. And I've had writers say that to me over and over and over, you know, we all network and we've got to network because we learn and we improve our art. And this is how art has improved since the beginning of time is through networking with other artists. But they're not your readers. And writers love to read. There is an argument for that, but they are not the bulk of your readers or your listeners or, you know. Yeah. And they're they're wonderful people. I, I adore writers. Um, mm-hmm. But the idea is, when I went to be Santa, was I decided, okay, this I'm going to go directly to some place that will take me to people who want to hire Santa, mm-hmm. not people who are Santa. <laughs> All the Santa groups in the world, that's still not going to get me somebody to, buy, to hire me as Santa, because that's just another Santa. Mm-hmm. And there are huge amounts of groups of Santas, or, you know, mysteries people who do mystery parties, you know, I could friend them all I want, but they're not going to hire me. That's right. Uh, so, I, you know, you have to find the outlet. Now, the outlet is that you have to understand to get to the readers, to get to the um, those people. So, obviously, the place to go is Amazon mm-hmm. uh, or wherever your readerships are, are, are being found. I, I know there's a bunch of... I, Amazon is where I go. I, you know, I... I I dropped a lot of the other stuff because I know Amazon. Mm-hmm. Amazon's there. I know, you know I can send people there to my books. Um, the people know about it. You got it, and you got to use your social media. Yes, um, you really you know, do. Whatever that, and and don't over. But see, the difference here is, is that you're not selling to them at that moment. You're not selling them on buy my book, please buy my book, because you're going to lose people quickly. What, mm-hmm. you, what you're going to do is you're going to talk about you. Yeah. You want them to be, be interested in you. Um, or if you have something about the Titanic, Deception, well, we're coming up to the anniversary again. So you can talk about, you know, all the stuff that happened with the Titanic to build up to this grand, mm-hmm. magnificent, beautiful ship that's going to be launched and all that's made in voyage and all that happens. And you can put that stuff down and you start talking about that. You start putting that out there to get people to get interested and go, yeah. oh, I love the movie Titanic, which is a great thing. Talk about the movie that it's involved with. Uh, talk about the subject. Or if you're selling the book on how to um, crochet, then talk about all the wonders it is to crochet and how what pieces you've been doing and what's going on mm-hmm. and make it into that because that's what they're going to because nobody likes to be sold to. Ford doesn't sell you, uh, you know, buying their trucks. They mm-hmm. sell to you how it feels, the power, yeah. the wonder, the yeah. beauty of being out there in that truck. Yeah. How you can throw the stuff in the back of that truck and go out into the wilderness yeah. or bring that stuff home and you're, you know. The, I I, I look at it this way. If you've got a niche audience, um, if you've got um, people who must find out what you know, then they will connect with you somehow regardless, even if you do nothing uh, or the bare minimum. Um, Excuse me, but except to put your work out there. But if you're in the arts, um, the pure arts like writing or painting, it's all about you. It really is. People want to know you. You've got to be accessible. And it's uh, it's difficult for a lot of people because a lot of artists and writers uh, have a natural introversion, but um, you have to overcome yeah, it because... I That's the hard part, is that, you know, we spend a lifetime writing these you know, books, and then we have to spend a lifetime trying to figure out how to sell them. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. thank God we don't have to have, you know, boxes in our garages of... 50,000 books. That's right. Thank God for that. <laughs> well, we, we, the, the, the thing is, is that to uh, get out there, and it's hard. Mm-hmm. And you have to put a plan together. You have to think about where you're going to go. Where, where's, my, where, where's my audience? Who is yeah. my audience? And I, I, I know these are all basics. To how do you know to find an audience? That's the hard part. Yeah, they're not that basic because most writers are asking the same question. And um, most of the writers I know are pretty smart people. You know, they're not they're not dummies. And if they um, if they had been able to find that magic platform or that magic pill again for platform building, then they would have done so. So it is hard work. Also, 
it might work for them, but it doesn't mean it will work for you. Mm -hmm. Because you're not the same person. You're not the same type of uh, uh, drive for that, or it's not the same. You know, some people have no trouble, you know, standing in line at a at a store and turning to somebody and going, "Hey, you know, I write books." Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, oh okay. yeah. Well, we have a fellow here in Toronto. Um, Honest Dad. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of him, but. Uh, he he was he was a, a feature, a, a common feature here in Toronto. Everybody in Toronto knows. And a long time ago, he had uh, been selling books outside of his, like out of the trunk of his car. I mean, um, you're going to have to Google Honest Ed's Toronto. Um, uh, all our listeners, I invite you to Google Honest Ed's Toronto and uh, see what you learn. But uh, that was then, and this is now, and that's the other thing. A lot of writers, because they tend to be many of them academically inclined, they have difficulty grasping the future, and even the now, you know. And uh, there's something to be said for being able to just throw that down as a gauntlet and say, this really is now. Yeah, and it's hard. And it's it, it's a it's a constant struggle, and it's a constant everyday thing. You have to work at it every day. Mm -hmm. You have to put it out there. I'm I'm guilty of not doing that. You know, I I you know, uh, yeah. I have these books, and I don't always mention it. I don't always talk about it. And mention I, a couple I of your books. Out. Mention a couple of your books, John. Let me put oh, you on well, the hot yeah, seat. I had the Titanic Deception, which mm -hmm. is a, a wonderful, wonderful thriller romance um, novel that takes you through a whirlwind, you know, the guy finds out about his grandmother being on the Titanic, he has a diary from that, from the diary he finds out that there's stuff that she knew, and then he's at his work, he finds, he goes in, he's a, he's just a catering to each room out of the central kitchen and where he works. And, and it's a great book. Like, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. And then I we have the talking board, which Tony and I that was my wife and I put wrote that together. Then we did the talking board, which is uh, uh, six stories, uh, three by my wife, three by me. Um, the talking board is the Ouija board, and uh, she, so she has one about the Ouija board and one about a woman who has trouble with her uh, image of how she feels herself. She can't gain weight. She's very self. You know, she's so skinny. I think that's and called then, more than a shadow, right? Yeah, it's fun. That's a great one. Yeah. And then she has one about Jack the Ripper. What if it wasn't, you know, what if it happened to be a bad, a love story gone wrong? Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. And then, of course, I wrote uh, three uh, three myself. One's a love story between a ghost and a, a woman uh, and having a love affair. And uh, I also did two murder mysteries. One's a private eye takes a simple trip with the mob boss to a a seance, and it's a locked room mystery. Uh, a murder happens in the seance, and they have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Lavender and Vine series. I would, I hope to do more. And this is, uh, they go on a whirlwind murder. And she uses, uh, you know, her psychic ability to uh, figure out murders and things going on. And uh, it's fun. I, I it is. It's a lot of fun, and you're working all the time at it. I I mean, I I know that you're you're always you're always creating and always coming up with something new. And this is one of the things that I really admire about you and Tony. Um, you've got a, a sort of a dual edge to you. On the one hand, you're very forward thinking, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. Um, but on the other hand, you've also got a classical element in that. Um, you believe in finding the right structure and learning your art and learning your craft and uh, not just throwing it out in the wind and hoping that it's all right, you know? Yeah, well, you have to give people... You're asking money from people. So, mm -hmm. so that's the first part, is that I'm asking you to pay for my endeavors. So mm -hmm. I have to give you something that equates to that work. Yeah. But I also have to get a work that I think is worthy also. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing. So it's always that balance of what do I get for and how do I make this. And, you know, is yeah. it worthy of, you know, that's why when I write something, would it sell? Yeah. Or would it be enough? 
It is. It's a struggle. It's a real it's hard struggle. To spend. Yeah, is it worth my time to spend that amount of energy that it takes to write to do this? Will I get the return? And I, you know, I, I hate to say it that way, but you have to look at it. What's the return? And it doesn't have to be monetary. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm not talking always money. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about what is the return to your soul? What is the return to you as a, an artist, as a, your passion? Is there going to be a return? Mm-hmm. Because you can do this stuff, and it can just be because it's, you love doing it. And yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with that. Return. Yeah. That's the return. That is the return, absolutely. I mean, because we get so inspired by the great painters, and um, one of the things about the painters is that many of them weren't considered all that great in their lifetimes, and uh, and that's that's fine. You know, you do what you do because you love doing it. If you're able to make a living at it, then that's another art entirely. That's terrific, you know? Yeah. And it's, and it's nice, you know, I, I've been an actor and did stuff all my life, and I've made more money being Santa Claus than I've ever made money just being an actor. <laughs> Everybody and, loves Santa Claus, so, John. You know, so I take on this iconic character, and wow. How can know, people hire you stuff. to be Santa Claus? How can they reach oh, you? to? They, they go through a place called Gig Salad Online. Gig Salad Online. Gig Salad. And that's where they can find me to do Santa or murder mysteries. Um, uh, also, DMing, uh, D&D, being a, D, um, a dungeon master for them. Also, scavenger hunts and things like that. That's all on there. And uh, it's a marvelous thing. See, once again, you find a place now where people who are looking for this type of stuff are at. Not mm-hmm. the performers that do it, but the people who are looking to the, hey, I need somebody for my birthday party. I need somebody for this. And mm-hmm. they ask, you quote them a price, they hire you if they want. Yeah. You know, it costs yeah. them a certain amount of year to be part of these different uh, places. I've only part of one. Uh, I know people who are part of like four or five. I don't see the benefit. It's like I don't see the benefit of being part of 93 different places from my book. Uh, Amazon is where people are looking for books, so that's where I put it. And I understand people doing what they do and go through all these other things because they're told, you know, more I have it out there, the more people will see it. But Amazon is where people are looking for books. Yes, yes, that is the sad truth. That is, uh, well, maybe not sad. Who knows? As I say, I believe we're in a... We're in the eye of a storm right at the moment, and we don't know where all the barn roofs are going to land. We don't know right. where all the cattle are going to land. We don't know. <laughs> we really don't. So right now we just ride just that hurricane. Creativity-wise, that's a great revenue that you can get her for people. And some people make a lot of money there, and some people make pennies. Mm-hmm. And that's the way it's always going to be, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And Tons and tons of work into it and get very, re- very low return. Or uh, you could, some people just throw up something and it sells like nothing. And yeah. you don't ever know why, what is the difference. We don't always know what the algorithm is. I mean, we talk about algorithms, and you know that, uh, for example, if you have a, a product, which is your book on Amazon, if you are able to get people to review that book positively, then it is going to bump you up in the algorithms, and that's just a simple fact. And if you can't, if you can't get them to do that, then that's going to hurt your standing in the algorithms. So yeah, it's going to put you further down, and yeah. that's true. But also, you can put your book out there on other media, in your social media, in your book area, in your Twitter, in your, even on um, uh, on YouTube or whatever else. Don't be afraid to have areas where it could be seen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Put together a book trailer. Put together, um, you know, and talk about it on Twitter, about the subject, not by itself. People get tired of always hearing it. And I see on Twitter some of this go, that, you know, just their book name and a quick little thing, and boom. Well, that's the same message they do every day. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. That, that just kills you. That just, nobody cares. Yeah. Be yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And, and I know it's hard to do that, but be interesting. Figure yeah. out what, I, you know, it, 
people want, they want to know about you, the writer. Mm -hmm. In fandom, that's what it is. They want you. They want to, people want to know what Paul McCartney is. And this is why we have some celebrities who really produce nothing and yet are celebrities. Well, yeah. Look at all the the Kardashians. All they they produce is, is bad press for themselves, yet they make millions of dollars doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, exactly so, right. Wow, that, not that I recommend doing that. That's, it's, it's, it's <laughs> doing that. Hey, now, I'm <laughs> starting to get the germ of an idea here, John. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, if I've got to... figure out how to do it and not feel like a, like a, like a total dirtbag. And not that they're dirtbags, people. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are a money-making and thought-out machine. They yes, they are. Doing. And they're human beings as well. And... Uh, you know, but but they. I mean, I marvel at their ability to make money for nothing, like the song know. says. You know, I was sitting there for a while. I was just like, my God, that woman is making money just being carrying a little dog around and having little, you know, dangly things, you know, all over the place. You know, yeah. That kind of, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. But hey, that's what was I hit then. That's the thing. John, I've got to thank you for coming on Dead to Rights. I really appreciate you taking the time today and share your insights in the industry and uh, in the arts in general because your your artistic background is a lot more vast than just writing. So thank you very much for doing that. Oh, I enjoyed it immensely. I would come back anytime you want. I will definitely be having you back. <laughs> I plan to do this in 2019 as well. So. Yeah, and I'll want to hear about what you're up to at that point, too. I've got to shout out a huge Dead to Rights thank you to John Rakestraw for being on the pod today, April 1st, for our episode 14 of Dead to Rights. You can find Dead to Rights at deadtorights.ca or at our Facebook page, if you're still on Facebook after all the news that's been out. We'd sure love to see you there. If you've got a question you'd like me to ask any of our authors, or you'd like me to try to answer myself, please go to the Dead to Rights Facebook page and post your question there. I'll watch for it and be sure to include it in a future episode. Our Twitter handle is at Dead to Rights Pod. We'd love to hear from you at CarrickPublishing.com or at our Carrick Publishing Facebook page. You can find me, Donna Carrick, on Twitter at Donna underscore Carrick or at my website, DonnaCarrick.com. If you're a published author and you'd like to join our listeners on the pod, contact me at CarrickPublishing at Rogers.com and say, schedule me for an interview. Be sure to join us again on April 8th when we'll bring you an interview with author Janet Kello, as well as a short story for our readers on the run titled The Monkey, the Croc, and the T-Rex by Alec Carrick. Our Dead to Rights theme song is Eyes of Gold, composed and performed by Ted Carrick, who also brought us the story scoring music. Thanks for joining us. See you next week. Dusty road, a man alone. His vital signs go on hold. And I don't know what you've been told. But the years have turned my eyes gold. And I told you what you told me. We'd never be in the same boat for free, yet it rides, let it rock.